Good morning and another beautiful day to you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Now we are continuing our journey from Scotland to South Africa in our landy and we have enjoyed a wonderful time in Mali. Now we're heading to Niger. So you drop, I think you go to Nima in Mali and that's where you do the paperwork for Mali then you have to cross south into Niger. Now, it's not as easy as it sounds. The road is not signposted and there's technically no border. Well, no border area because in that space where Niger and Mali meet, there is no town. So you, it's like a hundred kilometers north where you check out of Mali, then you have to drive south. And then we were told you have to find a police checkpoint where you get your paperwork done once you're in the first town you come to in Niger. So we set off, trundle south, and there's no border, there's no villages, there's not much around there at all, to be honest. And two hours, three hours in, we're stopping people and saying, you know, where are we? What country are we in? And in that area of the desert, there is no country identity. So, you know, we're saying Nisha, Mali, and people are like shaking their heads and pointing this way down the road. So we kept trundling, not really knowing which country we're in. Eventually we came to a, a sizable town, which in that, you know, place means, you know, maybe a hundred or so dwellings. No petrol station, no food, a water well. Uh, parked up and went to find the police station. So it, uh, some helpful young man came out and uh, left Jennifer with the Land Rover took all the paperwork because traveling with the Land Rover, reg, reg, UK registered Land Rover, had not only to stamp our passports in and out of every country, but I had to stamp a carnet de passage, which is like a, a temporary import uh, document for the Land Rover in and out of every country. And they check that you've made in and out, so you have to get it done. So I walk off with this guy to the town center and get shown to the police station. I go upstairs, there's this nice guy in a uniform, sitting behind a big desk in a completely empty office, nothing in the office at all, no phone, nothing, no paper, a chair, a desk, a him, a him, him, a chair, a desk, that was it, that was all there was. And um, so uh, introduced myself, said hello, and uh, said that I needed the paperwork done. He looks at the paperwork and he's like, hmm, hmm. And he sort of pushes the paperwork to one side of his desk and looks at me. And I'm sort of going, okay. And I said, is everything okay? So that'd be it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I need a present, he announces. You know what that means. And, and I sort of, I try to not engender bribing because you don't have to pay for this it's you know meant to be done it's free and I said oh I didn't bring anything with me maybe you know I'll find something in the Land Rover to give you as a, a present as uh, I wasn't going to give cash and he thought about it and okay so he stamped the passport it's the carnet and the carnet you have to fill out all the I'd filled out all the things and he checks it stamps gets the paperwork but he doesn't give them to me. He then calls a, a constable, I think he was, a, you know, a policeman or, or some other person who works for him, and uh, gives the paperwork to him and gives him instructions, blah, 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 in a language I understand. But basically, I can get the gist of he's saying, OK, he's going to go to the Land Rover. You keep the documents. When he gives you my present, then you give him the paperwork. OK, that's fine. So off we walk back to the Land Rover. It's about 10 minutes. Walk back to the Land Rover. And uh, Jennifer's waiting. She's been waiting now for like an hour for this process. And um, I go, oh, okay, we need a present to give to the police chief for stamping our documents. She goes, I know exactly what to give him. Because one of the disadvantages of traveling with a Land Rover is you end up packing too much, especially if there's only two of us in a vehicle, big long wheel Land Rover long wheelbase Land Rover, lots of space. We took lots of things that we never used. And there was one thing that we thought might be useful, that had actually become a pain in the neck. 
it was a big toasting fork, <laughs> like a big fork with two prongs on it that we thought, you know, might be useful for toasting things like that. We never used it and it was really sharp and it was quite big, it was quite long and it was poking holes in things and hit cutting my fingers on it while I was packing away and couldn't find a home for it in the Land Rover. So Jennifer suggested, give him that and that'll be his present. I mean, he's expecting cash. So I rummage around in the back of the Landy, come around the corner with this toasting fork and the poor guy's standing there and I take the documentation out of his hand and present him the fork and say, Chief's present. <laughs> and you can see him. He looked at the toasting fork and looked at me and <laughs> say, what is my chief going to say or do with this when I give him this as my present instead of cash? Well, we didn't hang around to find out. We <laughs> jumped in the landy and we were gone. And we were officially in Niger. Now, Niger is, I would like to say, an interesting country, but it does have some interesting parts, but it's not exactly a fascinating country. It's, it's smack in, it's a landlocked land um, country, the biggest country of Western Africa, but 80% of it is uninhabitable Sahara Desert. And the bit along the Niger River on the south is where the 22 million population of the whole country live in that 20% of the country. And unfortunately, it doesn't rank well in development. In the United Nations Human Development Index, which ranks um, life expectancy, education, your prospects of, um, of wages, etc. Out of 189 countries, Niger ranks 189. It is right down there in the bottom. And it, it doesn't have anything. It has no natural resources. It doesn't have salt like... Um, Mali has in Timbuktu. It has no mining, it has no development, it has barely any roads or cities. Uh, so it's not the most exciting country in the world. And yeah, there wasn't a great deal to see there. But we drove down to Niamey, the capital, and one of the main things we needed to do there was get our visa for Chad, the next country along. As I said, we're getting country visas a country at a time. You can't apply for them any further in advance because they're only valid for so many days. Once you've got them, you've got to be at the border within so many days and then they're valid for your visa period, usually 30 days. So we found some accommodation in Yami in the town centre. It's, it's a small capital city, very quiet, very, very African city. Dusty streets, cows, cattle, people in the streets, minding their own business. Nobody bothers you. Very friendly. Um, although my wife did get harassed there because uh, it's a very strong Muslim country and um, uh, once we're walking along and, and quite a few groups of men and boys tried to grab her bottom as we walked past. It's not a pleasant experience. But that aside, we found the Chad Embassy eventually after walking around for miles and miles trying to find it because there was no Google Maps or anything then. We just had a vague description of the street and asking people. We found the Chad Embassy, had our passports and went in and said we needed to apply for a visa for us to go to Chad in the coming weeks. And the guy, hmm, let's have a cup of tea. He didn't get many, I mean, it's a Chad embassy in Niger. I don't know how often he sees people, but not very often. Um, so he wanted to have a cup of tea and he wanted to chat and he wanted to talk about the Queen, the Queen of England, because clearly coming from England, I know the Queen of England. Um, and uh, Manchester United football. Of course, even in the middle of Africa, you've got Manchester United fans. And having lived in Manchester, I could talk about that quite intelligently. Not so much about the Queen, though. Uh, while we're waiting, talking, for the time, two hours, we're sitting, drinking tea, chatting away. All we want is our fees. But, you know, he has the power. He has the stamp that says we can go or not go. So we're sitting, chatting, and some other foreigners turn up. Also in Alandi, and this is the first people, other people we'd seen traveling cross country from our, for, since we left Morocco. And they were a group of French guys. And uh, they came in and, uh, you know, they were sort of, you know, came in and, uh, um, and we were sitting down having tea and they just burst in and, and said, oh, we need visa for, for Chad, we need visas. And the guy says, wait, wait, you know, you know outside, outside, when I'm, I'm busy, busy. So they sort of went outside and he went, oh, so rude. The French are so rude. He says, I will give you your visa. And he got out his stamp and he stamped my passport, stamped Jennifer's passport, 
pass them across the table and she said thank you very much for spending the time and chatting to me and being polite so you can have visas. Those French guys, I won't give them visa. They're too rude. <laughs> and I don't know if he did give them the visas or not, but I felt so sorry for them. I mean, it's, there's no reason not to. It's just he's got the power to or not to. So we got our visas and we were out of there. So we were happy with our visas and we went to see the one thing that we had heard about and that we were missing so far in our trip. Wildlife. Now, there's a very famous park, well, very fam famous in Nisia. Uh, there's a wildlife park in Nisia called Park W, which is W, Park W, because it's on a very built around a bend, two bends in the river that form the shape W, hence Park W. Um, so we drove down there, very excited to get to see some wildlife out of the city life, and it's all by the river, so away from the desert, the lush green life, we're very excited. Drove down there, eventually found our way into the park, and there's only one campsite at that point that was open and accessible and usable in the park. So we drove in there, and we were actually quite surprised to see there was a group of people already there, because we hadn't met anybody else en route. Uh, when we got there, they were very excited to see us as well because it was a group, a sick, a sick group of six French students who were doing their university thesis on the underwater tunes, uh, vocals of hippos. <laughs> and they had gone to Chad to Park du Bouvet to do this research and they hadn't seen anybody for weeks. So they were really glad to meet some uh, new faces. Also, They'd been dropped off there to do this research. They had a boat, they could go on the river, but they had no vehicle, no vehicle at all. They relied on the locals bringing them supplies. So when we offered to take them on a game drive, they were ecstatic. They piled on the roof of the landy and we went for a, a game drive around this park. Now the park is quite fascinating. It's got, it, again, the desert encroaches one side, but then the river brings life on the other side. It is a beautiful national park, loads of bird species. It also has the big, Four of the big five, there is elephant, lion, leopard, and buffalo. But, uh, there's no rhino in the park, unfortunately, for obvious reasons, being poached out. Um, having said that, there is only seven elephant in the park. So to see them would have been very exciting. And on our game drive, we did. We didn't see them all, but we saw, I think, five of the seven, only seven elephant that are living in that park. I hope sincerely today they're still around. But we also some, saw something that was even more rare in the park, giraffe. Now I know in general giraffe are not considered a scarce animal, although they are getting scarce worldwide, but there's a West African species that there is only one herd left and that is in the park. They're very similar to the Southern African species, um, slightly smaller, little lighter, same pattern, uh, but we did manage to see them as well. So we saw the last existing herd of West African giraffe and lots of bird life. So that was fascinating. And the, and the French guys really enjoyed their trip on top of the landy. It's the first time, that, I think they'd been there for several weeks and they hadn't gone for a game drive in the park. They'd been stuck at the camp. They had no vehicle. So that was great. So we went back to the camp that uh, after our game drive. Uh, had, all had supper together, we cooked them some of our food, because again, they didn't really have many supplies, so we cooked a nice meal, shared our water and coffee and tea. They didn't even have tea and coffee. <laughs> we had supplies. So we had a great time, and they said, well, you should come out with us tonight. Uh, what do you mean tonight? We, we, you know, you're not allowed to do game drives here. And they go, well, no, no, we go out on our boat. Part of our research, what we're doing, is we're going to make a song album of hippo tunes. That is what they were there to do, as well as study how hippos communicate. So they said, what we do when it gets dark, because the hippos are most active at night, they don't do much during the day, we go out with a boat and a microphone, and we've got three microphones, two on top of the boat, one actually we lower into the water to record hippo noises. And Jennifer and I sort of looked at each other and thought, well, this sounds quite an exciting trip, but, but, do you know which animal kills most people in Africa every year? Yeah, the hippo, because <laughs> hippos, although they're not carnivorous, they don't eat humans, they don't attack humans to eat them, they are extremely protective of their territory and they have massive jaws and usually they attack boats and people if they're caught and they just chomp them in half and spit them out. I mean, it's instant death if you get bitten in half. 
by a hippo. So we were like, well, this sounds exciting, but isn't it a bit risky? Then no, no, we've been doing it for weeks. It's absolutely fine. No. Okay then. Okay, what well, have we got to lose? Well, okay, we've got a lot to lose, but let's go. I'm sure these students know what they're doing. What a stupid idea it was to say that. So we went out in the boat and yeah, I, I must admit, it was quite terrifying. I mean, we got rushed by elephants in the water, but from the land, from, not from elephants, from hippos, from the water, from the land. How they had survived that many weeks alive, I have no idea. Because once we got out on the boat, they clearly had no idea what they were doing. They hadn't, they didn't understand hippos. They would see hippos and drive the boat towards them to get the noise. Because, you know, microphones, not sensitive like they were today, and even the ones they had, they had to get close to get the noise. And then when the hippos submerged, they were very excited. They wanted to get over the hippo to lower the microphone in to get the sounds. But of course, hippos also, one of their attack moves is to come up under boats to flip it up and chop the things in half with their big jaws and go off. I was very glad when we made it back to shore, all intact without being flipped by hippos and, and chomped alive. That was not a way I chose to go. But it didn't end there. Once we got back to the camp, the camp was full of lion footprints. This is, this, the, the camp is not fenced in anyway. It's just a, an, a designated area with a little toilet block where you're allowed to camp. There is no gates, no fences between anything comes and hippos and things came through the camp during the night. But in the time we had from supper, been on the boat and come back, lions had been walking through the camp. <laughs> there was lion footprints everywhere. And uh, there, were, there was a ranger staying there and he said, no, no, it's okay. It, uh, every night we put paraffin lamps out, and we put them around the camp and then the lions won't come because lions don't like the smell of paraffin. Right. Remember, Jennifer and I are sleeping without a tent on top of the Land Rover, completely out in the wild. Suddenly, that didn't, didn't seem such a good idea. But we still did. <laughs> but it was quite a nervous night. I tucked the mosquito net in. Not that the mosquito net would top a line, but um, I tucked the mosquito net in very carefully, laid out our bed, and we both slept in the middle of the Land Rover. I'm not sure we got a lot of sleep that night. And in the morning, there was more lion footprints walking right through the camp. They had been around the Land Rover, sniffing at the, the tent and the dorms for these other guys and wondering how it's like, ha, huh. the next night we put the tent up. <laughs> Didn't want to sleep on the Land Rover with a lion sniffing around a couple of nights. Not going to take that chance. So we spent a couple of nights there, a few nights there actually, because it is very beautiful, very peaceful. The bird life is fantastic. We didn't go out on the boat again. We did sleep in the tent and we did take the guys for another couple of game drives so they could enjoy the park that they were going to be doing their thesis in. But then it was time to go because we had a limited amount of time before we had to present our Chad visa at the border and we still had to get right across Niger and apart from Park Dubalway there is not a great deal else to see in that country I'm afraid apart from the empty desert hmm. seen enough desert already so off we chugged excuse me and it's a long haul from Park Dubalway across to the border and uh, one of the things uh, so we had to do some stop offs on the way and there's one famous place, not famous to you, not famous to the world, famous to us, that we came to, um, or became famous to us, that we stopped off overnight. It was a little town called Zinder. It's in the middle of nowhere. There is practically nothing there, but it's the last town before you go to the border where there is fuel, water, and basic supplies. And there's a, a little, I was going to call it a campsite, but that's a really loose term for what it was. There is a long drop, which is a toilet, which is basically a hole dug in the ground that's dug into a pit. Nothing, no water or anything. And, um, and that was it. And we, we went to camp there for the night. Um, we had the usual people arriving, trying to sell us things, be our friends, you know, from the local village. Because they didn't see much coming through that. Uh, so we got quite a bit of attention. But as dusk came, they all disappeared. They all went. Poof, everyone was gone. Which we were quite glad of. We sat around our fire. And it was getting dark, 
and we suddenly were like we heard this really weird noise like and we sort of look at each other and we're sort of like what on earth is that now we were just sitting in the firelight you know we had torches and things but you know you, you make your supper you sit in your chair you admire the stars you're out in the great outdoors you don't want lots of lights and of course lights attract insects and things like that so we didn't have many lights on we just had the fire we just got the glow of the fire we're looking around we can't see anything so i get the torch get the mag light out and i'm sort of going around and, and i uh, what is the sound and it's coming from the long drop area so I'm sort of like sweeping the beam out, sitting in my chair. Now, have you seen the movie The Mummy? And there's a part in there where all these scarab beetles pour out by the thousand and, and consume everything in their path and go inside your skin and argh, eat you from the inside out. The scene that I played the light on reminded me of that because coming from the long drop was literally hundreds of cockroaches and I am talking the biggest cockroaches I have ever seen and I have seen lots of cockroaches and insects across Africa this was sheer terrifying and as dusk came they all emerged and they were heading towards our camp to scavenge whatever they could from food and stuff that was put down fortunately we didn't live there but what a sight and I just grabbed a a log from the fire a stick from the fire and was waving it in front of them to hold these things back and they, what, they were literally, it became what we call the Battle of Zindere, holding back these massive monster cockroaches that were determined to eat us. And uh, yes, so we very quickly, while well, I held up these, back these cockroaches by, and I basically drew a thing in the sand and I was sprinkling the, the coals in, in the sand to keep them back. And they were making this horrible noise. <laughs> it was, oh, it was so eerie. At, uh, Jennifer packed everything up and, and cleared everything away so there was nothing for them to eat. And then we're sort of like, well, if we can sleep on the roof of the Land Rover, these things can climb. You know, that you know they can climb up. The, the, like, will they climb in the Land Rover? Will they find all the stuff? For, oh my goodness! So we ended up driving out of the campsite. <laughs> we left our little circle of fire around around the. We actually made a circle of fire around the toilet, <laughs> the long drop, to keep all these things back. Then we got in the Land Rover and we actually drove out of the campsite into a little bit of desert and slept there instead. You see, some campsites are not cracked up to what they're supposed to be. It was, it was quite nice at first. No wonder the locals left at, at uh, dusk. But that was our last day in Niger. So it was quite a scary day. But now we had our next task. We had to leave Niger and we were on to the next country, which is Chad. So. The next part, the next part of the journey, crossing into Chad, is probably the most difficult and most dangerous one of our journey. And we had to fill up all our water, all our fuel, all our food. And next stop is Lake Chad.